Good morning. How are you all doing this morning? That music's getting us off to a rousing start, don't you think? I'm so happy to have all of you here this bright and early launch to SOCAP. We had a great day yesterday looking at a lot of the diverse pieces of what's going on around the world and in our own space about impact investing and social entrepreneurship and ways to change the world for better. As many of you know, if not all of you at this point, this is our 10th SOCAP. And Lindsay Smalling, who is our content producer and the curator of SOCAP, has put together an amazing program for us this morning about this global movement and where it's come and how much room there is to grow in that space. So I want to invite Tracy Palangin from Social Finance to the stage to introduce this first panel that is really and truly going to give us a global perspective on what's going on with social entrepreneurship and impact investing around the globe. Tracy. Good morning, everyone, and happy birthday, SOCAP. Uh, Ten years of what I walked in this morning, meaning and money, harnessing markets and finance to, to serve society. I'm delighted uh, to be kicking off Wednesday morning with an amazing group of folks from far corners of the world to talk about the global movement in impact investing. So with me, we have representatives from India, Mexico, the UK, and the good US of A. And um, before I move to the panelists to talk about this broader effort, which was started in 2013, which is now coined the Global Steering Group on Impact Investing. I just want to share a little bit of history on how this movement began, which is incredibly exciting. So for those of you who know Sir Ronald Cohen, um, you will know that he's a force of nature. So Sir Ronnie convinced um, the UK presidency when they were hosting the G8 back in 2013 to set up this task force, the G8 task force for impact investing. And as you all appreciate, the G8 quickly became G7. This is even you know, before the latest Russia woes. This is the Crimea challenge back in uh, 2013. And yet the seven countries really rallied behind this global vision and uh, set up national advisory boards, um, of which uh, you see some of these representatives. Over the last four years, that G7 mandate has grown to 16 countries and the, um, and the EU. And then this past summer in Chicago, where the MacArthur Foundation hosted the Global Steering Group, we were just extraordinarily blessed to have 560 delegates from 43 countries. And the, 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 the energy was just so palpable in, in Chicago. And um, as we look to the G20, when uh, Argentina is hosting the G20, with a, a really sharp focus on inclusive economies, we're really excited to bring this voice to uh, those new settings. And as we speak, there are efforts uh, being stood up in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia. So it really is an exciting movement. So I'm delighted to be here to um, have our fantastic panelists share some of their country um, context. So as you can appreciate, there are these uh, national advisory board, which together form the Global Steering Group on Impact Investing. And as I mentioned, we have uh, four wonderful panelists together with us here today. And I'll start off by asking Fran Siegel, who's the executive director of the US Impact Investing Alliance, and, and then successively to, to each of the panelists, to talk about each country's ecosystem, the very specific regulatory political context, the various stages of growth, and how the National Advisory Board is in service of that country's priorities. So Fran. Thank you, Tracy, and good morning, everyone. Great to see you all. Um, so I, as Tracy said, I'm Fran Siegel. I'm the executive director of the US Impact Investing Alliance, which is a field building organization dedicated to increasing the flow of capital to impact investing across asset classes globally. So the state of the US market, I think it will be the topic of the next two days. Um, I will touch on some high points now. If you're interested in a deeper dive, um, I invite you to join Kathy Clark and I at 1045 at the Cowell Theater, where we're going to have an hour conversation about impact investing and the state of the field in the United States. But at a very high level, uh, when I think about asset owners moving into the space, 
um, we see a kind of mainstream of impact investing, and we're, we'll be talking over the next two days, I imagine, about uh, the pros and some of the challenges of that mainstreaming. So we see institutional investors, including foundations and even some pension funds and university endowments moving into the space. Um, while we also see high net worth families leading the way and even retail investors. So there have been an interesting rise of robo advisors serving retail investors with public security options. Um, we have an increasingly complex intermediary landscape um, that uh, we'll also be talking about over the next uh, couple of days. And we also have mainstream, uh, both mainstream uh, and incumbent and pure play asset managers like Bain Capital and TPG Rise and others entering the field while we have a pure plays like uh, DBL Capital raising a third fund at 400 million. So we're getting to scale on the supply side. Um, we, I, I think, still need some evolution on the intermediary side, which maybe Lori can speak to. Um, I'm very excited about putting more of a spotlight on the demand side, so um, impact entrepreneurs and public company managers that deliver impact. After all, that is why we're here, is uh, a focus on the impact. So in the coming years, I'm very interested in that. At a super high level, um, our mission is to put measurable social and environmental impact at the center of all investment decisions alongside financial return and risk. And we do that with a three-part strategy of creating and enabling policy environment for impact investing, catalyze institutional capital flows for impact, and building the movement as part of the global steering group and as colleagues of these great folks. Fantastic, Fran. Lori Spangler, you may sound American, but you're actually here <laughs> representing the UK NAB. Tell us about what's happening in, 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 in the UK. Thanks, Tracy. Yes, despite my accent, I am actually a legitimate member of the UK National Advisory Board. I'm based in the UK and have been for quite some time. And I think what's exciting about the UK National Advisory Board is that we, the current board, we stand on the shoulders of the prior boards. So we've had continuous engagement for many years, but with different people around the table. And I think that's been very helpful to propelling more focus and more action. When we look at the ecosystem in the UK, we have a number of strong actors across the continuum that Fran referenced on the supply side, demand side, and intermediaries. Uh, big society capital is often cited as one of the exemplars on the supply side. It's, a, it's the lead wholesale financial institution for impact businesses in the United Kingdom, and it was created out of dormant bank accounts that the, gov the UK government instigated an initiative to capitalize the bank. It is growing both domestically, but more importantly, it's also providing a model for other countries that want to adopt this approach and create other forms of big society capitals in their own countries, Japan being the latest, at a much bigger size and scale than the United Kingdom actually did. So what I would say is that the pieces of the ecosystem, some strong actors exist, but they're not yet uh, to the level where they need to be to really transform markets and go mainstream as Fran invited. But I would say also they're not working as effectively together. So the connective tissue of the ecosystem is really not where we want it to be. And that's where the, the current NAB is focusing our efforts. How can we strengthen both individual actors, but more importantly, the way those actors work between and among one another? And the particular backdrop in the UK, I would just add, is, is creating an opportunity for further engagement. We have the ear of government coming out of the very painful Brexit vote, and now the even more painful Brexit negotiations. We have the ear of government, we have the ear of business, we have the ear of society, because people recognize business as usual has not worked for folks. Inequality of income, but inequality of asset distribution is tremendous and it is a problem. Climate change, people are experiencing that, and the burden of delivery of social services for an aging population, whether it's through healthcare or other types of social services, these are pressing challenges and concerns, and they're turning to us for ideas and solutions and suggestions. So quite honestly, the UK NAB now is saying, how do we tap that ear, that engagement, and convert it to action? We're issuing our, our next report on October 16th, and in the next round, I'll give you a few highlights of the types of things we're focusing on to convert engagement to action. Thank you, Laurie. Rodrigo, take it from here. Okay, thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. Um, so I represent the Mexican National Advisory Board, which is probably very new. We have been working together for about a year. Uh, 
she wrote a call and was in a, in a conference we organized in, in Merida that, that we have been doing for seven years. And he was surprised about the, the, how the ecosystem was working in Latin America for impact investing. Um, he, he invited us to, to start a national advisory board for Mexico. Uh, we got approval uh, last year from, from the GSG. So we're very happy to, to be using this network of international like-minded organizations and people to, to really try to follow what it has been working in other countries. Um, we are in Mexico far away from what is happening in the UK or in the United States. But on the other hand, we have uh, very big opportunities to, to catch up. You know, I think it's not just the impact investing ecosystem which is behind, but it's the whole business universe. Like, the private equity industry in Mexico is growing, it's, 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 it's new. So we want to, to build this new industry with different, uh, with, in a different way. We don't want to change an industry, we want to create a new industry which is starting in Mexico. So we believe that being, a, being behind, it's an opportunity rather than, than, um, than a challenge. Um, it needs growing. I, I think the Mexican impact investing ecosystem, it's, it's growing a lot. So we have lots of accelerators, we have private equity funds, we have the media very interested in, in talking about these topics. We have some universities that are starting to put the, in the curriculum the impact investment uh, theory. Uh, we have some government programs already investing or, or, or pushing forward the agenda. Uh, there is a fund of funds that may be coming soon to invest in, uh, in impact investing. Um, some family offices, which is also very, something very new in Mexico to have this a professional, well-managed family offices, they're starting to invest in, in these funds and, and asking about, about, about the industry. So, so the industry is getting there. There are so many things we need to go through. For example, I think having a, a um, like big society capital back in Mexico looks pretty far away. You know, like uh, it doesn't seem we have a, the openness from the government to start doing these kind of much deeper things we need. But that's the challenge we're going to, th those are the kind of things we need to challenge through the National Advisory Board. Mm -hmm. We believe we have a thriving industry. I mean, we have energy, entrepreneurship, and now, but now we need some more um, aligned interest to, to really push the agenda in some spe very specific uh, issues that we believe is going gonna, 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 gonna to be able to make us thrive like, as an industry in Mexico. No, I mean, Rodrigo, thank you for underlining that one of the greatest benefits of having this global platform is the sharing of knowledge across the NABs. And, and uh, Lori mentioned Big Society Capital, which was created with unclaimed assets. And Lori also um, alluded to the Japanese experience. Let me just throw out the statistic, which we learned collectively in Chicago. The Japanese has approved by parliament, they still have to work through the regs, that annually, because it's such a high savings economy, that annually there is a billion dollars in unclaimed assets and they plan to put half of that aside to create a wholesale investment bank a la Big Society Capital. It's just like extraordinary numbers. So that is the power of, of, of the GSG and it's just really exciting. So, Kardec, tell us about India, which is a fairly developed ecosystem and, and you are hosting us in 2018 for, for GSG. Absolutely. So good morning, everyone. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. And like Lori, uh, you know, don't let my accent mistake you. I've been working in India for the last 10 years. Uh, and as Tracy is saying, the impact investing sector there is fairly developed and also somewhat distinct uh, from other countries, mainly in the, in the sense that it's mostly focused on the for-profit side. Uh, so it's very much a subset of the venture capital industry. It's been around for 10 years. Uh, just last year, we had McKinsey. Uh, put out a very detailed research report capturing the state of the sector and what's been happening. And they, and they came out with some pretty remarkable findings. So our National Advisory Board is, is constituted by what we call the Impact Investors Council, which is essentially an industry association of VC funds, foundations, family offices such as uh, Asha Impact and others. And uh, in total, there are about 35 plus members. So there's been almost five billion uh, US dollars that has been invested in the last six years. Uh, la the annual rate is about a billion dollars, so that's, that's fairly healthy numbers. Uh, most interestingly, there's, there's um, returns that have been demonstrated. The average IRR is about 11%, uh, which is fairly healthy, uh, and some, some which are m much higher, so comparable to mainstream you know, uh, venture capital. So that has given a lot of commercial investors uh, a strong you know, reason to come into impact investing. And currently in India, almost 50% of impact investment deals are actually done by mainstream commercial investors, and the balance 50% by, by impact investors. 
So that's a little bit about the state of the sector uh, currently. The government of India uh, you know, has a lot of national development priorities in various sectors which overlap with those of impact investors, specifically in areas like affordable housing, clean energy, sanitation, and financial inclusion. So increasingly, the focus of the NAB has been to work closely with the government. Uh, we have already gotten them to sort of understand impact investing as a sector and recognize the, the, the sector. But now it's really about working in specific, uh, specific sectors and getting the access to capital to flow. Uh, and looking a little bit ahead in some of the things that you know, the NAB is thinking about uh, and with respect to learnings from other countries, uh, it's, it's this notion of social impact bonds. Uh, Sir Cohen was in India uh, a year and a half back and uh, evangelized this notion. There was a roadshow that happened across Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, and a lot of people are very excited. And now we're actually talking with social finance and other large uh, institutions in India to set up outcomes funds for multiple sectors and look at both the for-profit and the not-for-profit sector. Uh, and scaling up this work even further. So, it, it really, just, really exciting times. Really, really exciting times. So, um, in Chicago this summer, um, Sir Ronnie, in his usual audacious um, fashion, kind of threw us all down the gauntlet and charged us uh, with reaching Tipping Point 2020, uh, which um, he articulated a couple of goals uh, around Tipping Point 2020. Chief among them is actually doubling the global assets in impact investing from the current 150 billion to 300 billion, as well as doubling the number of countries represented uh, on the global steering group, uh, all in service of, of the large uh, and fairly daunting UN uh, SDG goals. So, Fran, um, you know, we'll just go down the lane again. Um, tell us, you know, how are we getting to tipping point 2020 in the U.S.? Gosh, tipping first. 2020 seems right around the corner, yes. uh, so uh, 2020 is nigh. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about our policy work, which is one of the levers that the national advisory boards tend to use, um, depending on the political climate. Uh, so uh, there were two um, policy wins, I would say, that were very much a team effort. Uh, they came through Q4 of 2015 one from Treasury and one from Department of Labor that both bared on the nature of fiduciary duty and allowed respectively foundation fiduciaries and ERISA-regulated pension fund fiduciaries to take impact factors into account when making investment decisions for foundations as they make in, seek to make impact investing uh, choices through their endowment and for uh, pension funds through their corpus. Uh, and so one of the uh, priorities of the alliance is to take those policy wins, quote unquote, and move them into action. And so we are actively working with foundations. We're administering a group called the Foundation Presidents Council on Impact Investing. It's a group of 20 leading foundation presidents committed to impact investing. And so working to figure out ways we can partner um, together to deepen the practice of foundation endowment investing. And there we're partnering and, and uh, you know, standing on the shoulders of Mission Investors Exchange and Confluence and many others who have done some extraordinary work in this space. Um, also, uh, toe dipping around pension funds and, and working with others in that regard as well. And then I wanted to pick up something particularly that, that Lori said around um, access to capital issues and growing income inequality. Um, there's certainly a, a, a tense political environment in Washington right now. We believe that impact investing, uh, private capital for public good is something that has appeal across the aisle. And um, we are working actively with members of Congress and select um, uh, agencies to uh, figure out ways to flow through policy to encourage more private capital to flow to distressed communities in the United States, so rural and urban communities, um, and also to try to make the case for development finance in Washington so that more U.S. capital can flow to folks in the bottom of the pyramid and emerging and frontier markets. Fantastic. Lori. So in the UK, as I mentioned, we're just about to issue our report. We've looked at five areas where we really think we can move the dial on this tipping point and have concrete action. And we've, we've focused on three main actors, the government, business leaders, and investors. I'll just highlight three of the areas. The first is we, we're focusing on how we can empower savers to deploy their savings in line with their values. We believe there's just a mass opportunity if we really open up impact investing to everyone and not have this be 
a, a, an access point only for ultra high net worths or big institutional investors. So empowering savers to deploy their capital in line with their values. And there's a series of specific recommendations for government as well as corporations to make their corporate pension funds available um, and, and the offerings available for impact. The second is to focus on public procurement. The government itself in the UK spends over 240 billion pounds a year on goods and services. They are a huge actor. And so we've actually put a series of recommendations where they will consider social value, we've defined what that means, impact value, social value, as a specific criteria in evaluating who gets, who wins in the public procurement, who gets to deliver those goods and services. We think that could be, have, have a tremendous impact on a quantum of opportunity for impact businesses. And the third is strengthening the UK's role in international development. And I'm particularly, because of the work that Include does, I'm particularly excited about this one. A lot of our NAB work is domestically focused, as it should be. But this part of the NAB's work is looking outside the UK. And particularly on the heels of the Brexit vote, I think that the UK needs to reassert its interest in the rest of the world and its relationship to the rest of the world. We're home to CDC, which is one of the leading development finance institutions in the world, and we've made a specific appeal for CDC to become a champion domestically as well as internationally, because in the UK, we have two spheres of operators and impact, domestic actors and those who are based in the UK but operate internationally. And what we've discovered is that they're parallel universes, but they rarely talk, they rarely meet, they rarely share learnings, and they rarely co-invest. And so we're making a particular push to break down the domestic and the international silo, because we think that can lead to further activity. Fantastic. Well, um, 2020 seems very close, so um, what we're doing with the, with, the, with the NAV, we believe that uh, there are so many things going on. It's, we have a lot of individual uh, initiatives going through in, in Mexico, but as a NAV, we want to be very careful on how we use this resource, which is a, the most valuable resource, which is the power of, of being together. Uh, so, so we invited to the NAV, for example, we have the head of the private equity association, um, we have the head of universities, the head of banks. So we have a very diverse and very strong um, network uh, of, of, of people, organizations, that, that we believe that if we give the right structure and the right members, we're going to be able to, to really transform a lot of things. So we've been very careful in, in uh, not just doing things because we are, have a lot of energy. So we have been very careful in, uh, into studying, doing a little bit of research. Now, right now we are working on a piece of research to try to figure out which are the, le the levers that we need to, to pull and, and, and what capacity we have as a national advisory board. Because we believe that by, by 2020, we're going to be ready to do, to do that. I mean, we're, we're, our, our goal to, for 2020 is to really have a strong national advisory board um, to, to be able to, to, to do the good transformation. But we see the tipping point probably within more, 10 more years. And we believe that impact investing should be the new normal. We believe that we're not having these conversations in 10 years. Everybody will be measuring their impact. Everybody will be willing, the, understanding that every investment should have an impact. And, and, and we believe there's a, a big chance, a big possibility to, to transform this in the, new, in, in the new normal. Well, impact investing will be the new normal. And, and so we can go from tipping point to extinction in maybe 30 years, Rodrigo? OK. Karthik. Um. 2020 tipping, tipping point, I think, uh, look, in India, the scale of the problem is so huge, but we're blessed to have a great entrepreneurial climate, so we have a lot of entrepreneurs working on those problems. The McKinsey research that I just referred to mentions that already impact investing in India is on an annual basis impacting 60 to 80 million beneficiaries, so it's already at a, at a very large scale. So the government is starting to take notice of this, but it's still a very small amount of capital. It's a billion dollars. The government's development uh, social sector budget in India is 150 billion. So the focus is on really saying, what are the lessons that impact investors have, and how can the government scale that up to really impact you know, millions and millions of, of, of lives? So disengagement of the government is happening. Uh, the elections in India are in 2018, so our current government actually itself has 2020 targets, for example, for housing, because they want to say we need two terms to do this. So for example, 60 million urban homes need to be built, 100 million rural homes need to be built. And what impact investors are doing is we're aligning our own work with this. We're saying, look, we have 
invested in three, four, let's say, affordable housing companies who have got a private sector model to this problem, and the government is listening. PM Modi recently inaugurated something called the Champions of Change, where he got 400 CEOs, young CEOs, including myself, Vineet, some 15 impact investors are in that 400 people, and we're part of just today, October 11th, there's a discussion happening in New Delhi between impact investors and the government. So I think that is going to really have a big impact, and specifically with respect to the Outcomes Fund, which I know you're, you're involved in so closely. The biggest names in India are involved in this. Uh, the largest education foundation, Domestic League, Central Square Foundation, the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, the Tata Group, uh, which is our big corporate, uh, of course, the GSG and social finance. Uh, and we're talking about a billion dollar uh, outcomes fund. So I think all of these things, given the scale of the problems in India and what's needed and building upon the success of the social uh, impact investing sector is, is, is where the future is at. And the final point I would make is the importance of domestic capital that of the $5 billion of capital that has gone into India, 95% is foreign capital, and it's very welcome. But India is no longer a, you know, a low-income country, it's a medium-income country. There's a lot of wealth generation that has happened in India. So that is our focus as Asha Impact and various other impact investors, is now to mobilize capital from Indians and from people in those markets, other emerging markets, and complement the, the global capital that's coming in from the United States, from Europe, and from other developed countries. It really is exciting, Kartik. I think for the audience's benefit, you might want to just articulate a little bit how the Education Outcomes Fund is actually a different structure than um, how we've seen social impact funds develop in the UK and the US. Sure. So, so very briefly, as I said, uh, in India, we've got a very for-profit, venture capital-centric approach to impact investing. And that's not for any other reason except it's regulatorily driven. That, you know, taxes and so on, and the not-for-profit sector and the for-profit sector are funded differently. Uh, that being said, uh, the outcome fund is essentially going to take philanthropic capital from foundations, from CSR, from individuals. So that's the outcome fund. And then for-profit risk capital providers like ourselves can now, in addition to investing in equity, in growth stage companies, also give uh, essentially a debt-like, bond-like instrument to an NGO. And if the outcomes of that instrument are met in a defined way, then in three years, 500 girls in Rajasthan will have access to an education, and that actually happens, then me as a risk capital investor, that outcome fund will pay us, the social service provider and the investor, a defined rate of return. So essentially it blends the for-profit and the not-for-profit world and it brings us all together and it allows us to unlock from a $1 billion annual industry to a $150 billion annual industry because that's all the philanthropic capital that's technically available. So it's very, very transformative if this happens and it will happen in the next few years. I love the optimism, Kartik, and, and, and the, the Indians are really blending capital in whole new ways. And I see the clock counting down, but I hope that you get a sense of just the extraordinary breadth that we're seeing it from you know, middle-income countries to developed countries and the various approaches uh, to bring the supply, the demand side, and a very healthy ecosystem in service of what we call tipping point 2020 and maybe extinction 2050, so that it is the new normal, it is routine to think about not only risk return, but also impact in our investment decisions so that we can together, uh, with your help, the SOCAP community, achieve capital for its highest purpose. So thank you very much for being with us this morning.